The old Jewish story goes that uh, Yankel and Mendel are walking down the street. They're extremely hungry. They're destitute. They're Jewish peasants. And there's a sign outside the church that says, conversions to Christianity, we pay $1,000. Yankel says, Mendel, go in and we'll split it. Mendel says, no, Yankel, you go in. So Mendel agrees, okay, I'll go in. Walks into the church, comes out a half hour later, and he's a transformed man. The payas are cut, the yarmulke is gone, in the middle is a, one of those bald, Dominican kind of bald spots. And Yankel says to Mendel, 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 did you get the money? And Mendel looks at Yankel and says, all you Jews think about is money. <laughs> That, ladies and gentlemen, is unfortunately a very apt metaphor for what happened to a Jew named Jesus approximately 2,000 years ago. Because although we are here to debate who indeed was responsible for the murder of the historical Jesus, although we are here to clarify and ascertain who it was that ordered and carried out his death, in many ways, that question is less relevant than an even greater point. Because although, as I shall prove, it was the Romans and solely the Romans who put Jesus to death, it was the Christians who crucified Christ. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, my dear brothers and sisters, my Christian brothers and sisters, of course not all, but too many, Nail Jesus to a cross of hatred. They nailed him to the rancid wood of racism and bigotry. They took a man who was called the Prince of Peace and put a white hood on him. They took a man who so loved his people that he said in Matthew chapter 10, to the twelve apostles, go nowhere among the Gentiles, enter no town of the Samaritans, go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. They took that man and they put a swastika on his arm. And they made him the very fountain of anti-Semitism. If there was ever a greater act of character assassination in the history of the world, then I don't know it. And if Jesus were alive today, to look upon the rivers of blood, oceans of blood that have been spilt, his people's blood in his name. He would not want to live, and we wouldn't have to debate who killed him because he would kill himself without absolving anyone's sin, because no one can absolve that sin. Because all the blood on earth will not bring back one and a half million Jewish children of the Holocaust and all the blood on earth will not bring back thousands of pogroms and inquisitions and crusades. My people have been slaughtered in the name of one of our own. How ironic. Is this the Prince of Peace? The one who tells us in John 8 44 that Jews are the devil? Or in John 8 19 that Jews have no knowledge of God the Father? Or who tells us in John 8 21 that Jews are all destined to die in their sins? Is this the loving Jesus that my colleague, Mike Brown, has just told us about? One of the great New Testament scholars, Dagobert Runas, wrote, The New Testament contains 102 references to the Jews of the most degrading and malevolent kind, thereby creating in the minds and hearts of the Christian children and adults an ineradicable hatred toward the Jewish people. Mike said that the New Testament does not say that we kill Jesus once explicitly. It says so several times explicitly, beginning with Peter, the first pope, choice of the apostles. Acts chapter 2, verse 36. Therefore, let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him, both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucify. He is talking to the Jews. He is in a council of Jews. Acts chapter 3, verse 13. Peter speaking again. But you rejected, you Jews rejected, the holy and righteous one, and asked to have a murderer, Barabbas, given to you, and you killed, quote, the author of life, it is capitalized, whom God raised from the dead. Third place in the New Testament where it says the Jews killed Jesus. Peter speaking again, Acts chapter 5, verse 30. 
Peter tells members of the Jewish council, quote, the God of our ancestors raised up Jesus, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree. Whom you, not the Romans, had killed by hanging him on a tree. Should we believe Peter? Peter, ladies and gentlemen, is a confirmed liar. And if you say that I am anti-Christian for saying so, it was Jesus who said so. You know, we all know the story. In all four of the Gospels, Peter, you will deny me three times before the cock crows. A confirmed liar says, according to the, who Christians see as God, Jesus called him a liar. And he's the one that says that we killed God. What about Paul who says the same accusation? In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15. The Jews who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out, they displease God and they oppose everyone. Should we believe Paul? Well, Paul is a self-confessed liar. He says in Romans chapter 3, verse 7, If through my lies God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? Finally, ladies and gentlemen, Jesus himself seems to predict that he will be killed by the Jews. Matthew chapter 23 Verse 33, you serpents, you brood of vipers, how are you to escape being sentenced to hell? Therefore I send you prophets and wise men and scribes, some of you, some of whom you will kill and crucify. Crucify can only mean Jesus, the Jews never crucified anyone. It was a Roman death. And some you will scourge in the synagogues, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed on earth. Sure sounds like Matthew chapter 27 to me, where the Jews invited the curse of Jesus' blood upon them. From the blood of innocent Abel, the Jews are even responsible for the blood of Abel? To the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berachiah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. This is Jesus speaking. I believe Jesus was a great scholar. So he couldn't have made this mistake because the actual person who was put to death was Zechariah ben Yehoyada, who lived 324 years later. Clearly, then, the verse is a forgery. The point is, ladies and gentlemen, Jews and Christians today have entered into a totally new era. Gone are the pogroms and the blood libels of yesteryear. Gone are the cries of Christ killer. Gone are Jewish children going to American public schools and being made to cry at passion plays because they're always asked to play Judas. I don't look Jewish, so they never ask me. They always said to me, you look Swedish. You play Jesus. Because <laughs> he always has to have blonde hair and blue eyes. Ladies and gentlemen, the Christians are e arguably the best friends the Jews have in the United States today. We in the Jewish community are not just grateful to Christians in general and evangelical Christians like Mike Brown, my colleague in particular, for their support of Israel. We understand that it is their devout faith inspired by Jesus that makes them so supportive of Israel against Islamic suicide bombs. But what is this film all about and why are people getting behind it? Isn't this the past? Isn't the day of Jews being portrayed in a Hollywood movie as G crawling for Jesus' death, taking sadistic delight in the pain and torture of a man whom Christians regard as God? Isn't that old hat? Must we really never be able to move on? I ask you, can the human mind even conjure up a more heinous allegation not that someone is a mass murderer like Hitler having killed millions of humanity, but that a nation snuffed out the source of life itself. Is there a more heinous allegation that the human mind can conjure up that one nation blocked out the rays of the sun? Only one people have ever been accused of it, it's the Jews. And only one nation has ever made the accusation. It's the Christians. And I'm appealing to my Christ honest Christian brethren, wherever they may be, oppose this film because it is an act of glaring defamation and it is a lie.